Hello. Hello. Louisa Crispin. <laughs> Hello, Leslie. <laughs> Lovely to be here again. <laughs> Lovely to be here again. I think I was here last night and now I'm here again tonight. <laughs> Hello to everyone who's watching. Anyone who's watching us on Facebook Live, then please add your questions in the ask a question area. And after this session, myself or Louise will come in and answer them. Hello, Vincent, Maria, Edith. We've got quite a few people here live on Crowdcast as well, ready to ask their questions. But yeah, if you're over on Facebook and you've got questions, then pop them in the comments and after the live session, we, myself or Louisa will go over and answer them. Mainly Louisa, because I probably won't know the answers. But I'll tag you, Louisa, and get you to answer them. <laughs> so as I do every night, I'm just going to show you Louisa's page in the magazine so that everybody knows how to contact Louisa, because Louisa is going to be talking about this wonderful project that she has been working on. And I'm sure lots of you will want to contact her follow on her on instagram etc so just going to do that first before we start because otherwise i get into the conversation completely forget get to the end no one knows how to contact the person absolutely hopeless right okay i'm getting better i've only done what a thousand hours now i'm getting better at it right okay there it is there's the magazine so as we all know, you go to the Art360 and the Magazine tab and you will arrive on the magazine. As you go through the magazine, there's some lovely, lots of interesting information as you flip through. The great interview with Michael Stoushholm, the founder of Sprout. I really love talking to him about sustainability. And then you come to the contents. And as we can see here, Louisa, under the nature setting, is on page 23. So voila. There we go. She's next to the lovely Jane Cowan. So Louisa, you can contact by email. There you go. She there's her website. She's on Facebook. She's on Twitter. And she's on Instagram. So lots of places where you can contact Louisa and you can follow her, see what she's up to. And Tonight, we're going to talk about the Flight Pass series, which is what she's showing in the magazine on the page here and discussing in the magazine. So, without further ado, tell us about the Flight Pass series. Why? Where did it start? Because last time when we talked to you, you were talking all about experimenting with graphite and all the messy graphite, weren't you? And then all of a sudden, this Flight Pass project appeared the flight path series been going for about four years so it overlapped quite considerably yeah the, the graphite started um i needed to get off the clean white page i needed to put a bit more composition to everything so um i started playing with the graphite i did the residency at um, britain's fear where i really focused on trying to push the boundaries of what the graphite would do um, and learn more about it because there wasn't really very much out there. Around that time, um, we had an enormous wasp's nest in the loft. And although most of the wasps were going in and out um, through, the, through the roof, we didn't see much of them. A few of them found their way down through into the house and we'd come home from um, outings and find them all sort of lined up on the window. Really docile collection of wasps. We opened the window and they kind of peeled off like bombers setting off. <laughs> it was absolutely fascinating. Dover. I've got the idea of Dover in my mind now. Yeah. And obviously they don't always make it out. I mean, the, the wasps are not hugely long lived. So you're going to find them, start to find them around the house. Mm. And one particular day there was one on the window ledge. Um, and the sun was coming in and you've got this gorgeous slant of light across its sort of hip section and then this beautiful shadow created by the, the wings and, and the body. And you don't get those sort of shadows from other insects and it just absolutely fascinated me. So I started off sort of observational drawing, which is what I do, and trying to work out what it was about the wasp that made it different from a bee or a fly or a spider or you know what what are the things that make you recognize that it's a wasp mm -hmm. and then gradually I started using the graphite backgrounds within 
the drawings um, and building up. So um, the flight path theory started, but it was a slow burn. It, it's been over sort of four years of gradually putting mm. it all together. Mm. And it wasn't until I did the residency and, and solo show at um, Seven Oaks Visual Arts Forum that I really sat down and pulled all that information together to, to realise what the narrative was with this mm. particularly. Mm. And at what point did we hit lockdown in that evolution and how did that affect it? I'd be, that was probably two or three years into it and I was getting to the point where, well, to be honest, we just closed the gallery in, in Ticehurst mm. um, and the reason for closing that was to allow more time to really work on our own practices and, and explore them further and I hit a complete brick wall. I just couldn't face drawing another wasp I couldn't face I couldn't think of any compositions I couldn't think of a direction to take this I'd been sort of crumpling paper um I'd been playing with the powder in different ways and then lockdown hit um mm. I was lucky to have a commission very early on um for a B project Mm. Uh, which was great that got me back in the studio it got me thinking drawing and then I just went on from there following through all sorts of avenues really playing and exploring and trying to find my mojo back to it really and that relit what I was doing um, I did some courses with Sally Hurst um, which were looking at the surfaces of your paper I'm quite keen to get graphite out from behind the glass because it's mm. It's a really tactile material and it's got a beautiful silky finish to it, but it's a powder. And if you leave it out in, in sort of without glass, it just rubs away and disappears and makes everything dirty and, and gets damaged very easily. So I was going through some of her courses, trying to look at other options of what you could do with the graphite and adapting. She was talking about pigments and I was adapting it to, to play with the graphite with it. Um, I did a Domestica course, which was quite hilarious, really. That was on book binding. It was a, it was in Spanish. So online. It, <laughs> I'm presuming this is all online. Online, yes. <laughs> yeah. So each, each video within the course, I had to go through twice. The first one to read the subtitles and the second one to watch what her hands were doing. <laughs> but again, really useful, fed into some of what I was doing and what I was thinking about. So I did quite a lot of playing and trying to pull myself out of my comfort zone. Um, yes. One of so, Sally's courses was all about composition um, and it was a really insightful course. And it, the way you worked through it gave me the confidence to do the sketchbook project, um, the book, book, I can't say it, Brooklyn's um, sketchbook project. Mm. So I, I did, a, I've been wanting to do that for years and it finally gave me the time and the opportunity to do that. So that's um, the Brooklyn Library? Yes, it, yes, mm, yes. The Brooklyn Library. And they, and they, do they, they send you the little mini sketchbook and then you complete it and then you send it back? Yes, and then they digitise it. So you have, mm. you pay for it and that's what keeps the library running. So they've got mm. thousands of books now that mm. artists have done throughout the world and just sent to them for their, for them to look after. And obviously we think, you know, with lockdown, they, they've struggled as well. So, you know, they're trying to find ways to keep this library running now. Mm. Yeah. And that's interesting because as the project has evolved, you've done this concept where you've been sending out pieces of um, card, concertina card to people. Do you, where did that idea, where did that concept come from? Um, it came from the solo show, the residency. Um, I'd been creating new work and part of the residency, um, Seven Oaks Visual Arts Forum is a community group. The, mm -hmm. the library is a community space and when you do a solo show or a residency there they they encourage you to do something with the community so my idea was that I would do a little project with any school children or something that could come in um, and then we'd build up a little collection of something to show at the end of it mm. unfortunately <laughs> deep breath uh, lockdown was extended for the two weeks that 
two of the three weeks that I was in the gallery. So there were no mm. schools coming in. We were allowed eight people in the gallery at a time. Mm. So um, it, it wasn't possible to really run it within the library, um, within mm. the gallery space. So mm. I decided I wanted to, by that stage, I wanted to do it anyway and just see what happened. So I just launched it on Instagram and it snowballed. <laughs> no other word for it. Really. I, I was going to say, there is, I, I think it needs to have a bigger word than snowball, doesn't it? <laughs> Avalanche. <laughs> avalanche, yes. I think avalanche is a good one. I think you just hit a moment with yeah. it. Because yeah. as you said, when you stopped the gallery in Ticehurst, you kind of hit a bit of a wall and you needed something to get you back in. Hmm. And I think after the lockdowns, I think there were a lot of people out there, a lot of artists who were in a bit of a, you know, the, the wall phase. Yeah. And you launched it just at that moment, didn't you? Yes, I suppose it was. It was towards the end of lockdown. So a lot mm. of people had been out in their gardens. They'd been going for walks. Mm. They'd realised a lot more about what nature was about mm. and were keen in the same way that I am to learn more about what was in front of them. Um, mm. And the, the project makes you really look and makes you see things that, you might not have noticed previously so even on your work, walk to the shops people were noticing that there were things growing in the cracks in the pavement in the cities so you know urban wildlife they were finding things they were hearing things it sort of changed a perception that was started I think by the lockdown and, and the fact that we spent more time in our local space really and you notice the changes when you do that yes and when you send these packs out, do you send them with instructions or, or is it just you do? They get, I don't know how well you'll be able to see it. Yeah. So they get one of those, which is a very tactile thing that folds itself up. Tiny. Tiny. And a set of instructions. And it also comes with some information about two charities um, that I came across uh, during the lockdown. Well, one I knew about before, but the other one was during the lockdown. Um, the Bug Life charity I came across through a gallery called Groundworks in um, East Anglia. And they did, they had an online talk um, for one of their exhibitions and it was supported by the Bug Life charity. And when I looked at their website, I was just blown away with the amount of information that was on there to support you looking at insects. Um, whether you're a landowner, a farmer, an individual with a back garden, a community garden, there's all sorts of things in there that, that's really useful information. And they just created, just launched um, their Bee Lines project. And that's about creating wildlife corridors throughout the UK um, sort of encouraging the ability for insects to migrate within areas so we're not just mm. locked into nature reserves um, they were making use of the fact that thousands of us have gardens I think it's 400,000 hectares of gardens um, that can support wildlife when we're building everywhere else so mm. that, that was the point of the project and that sort of sparked this this sort of sparked an idea um, I was struggling to find places to draw the wasps within the marks on these bits of paper. Um, and when you fold it up, you sort of catch glimpses of the of the insects. And that sort of added to the, you know, when you go out in the garden, you might see an insect flip through. Chances are you don't know what it is, um, that mm. sort of thing. And the other charity, the other information was for um, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Well, I've been drawing bumblebees for years. I'm really... Mm really passionate about bumblebees and um, there's information about there and they had a project called be the change and the idea was to encourage you just to do something small within your own garden to encourage pollinators in mm -hmm. so planting wildflowers leaving bits um, and then gradually as the project went on I discovered more um, charitable sort of social media it was the power of social media there were more um, hashtags that you could follow and mm. that gave you a chance to join in and support wildlife so things like no mo may the idea being to 
leave your grass, not mow it during the whole of May and just see what happens. And it's amazing what grows within a lawn that you think only has grass. Mm. And the, the, then you start again to see the insects arriving, and the dandelions come up and the daisies and, and all sorts of things. Um, so those were the, the main ones that I can think of at this stage. So you're saying that um, you did quite a lot of, it sounds like there's a lot of research behind this moment of finding and a lot of, yeah, the, the <laughs> residency um, down, is it in Cornwall, the Brisson? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the residency in Cornwall and these online courses and these online things, it sounds like there's a lot of research actually behind there was project. a huge amount. There was also sort of joining in on some mail art projects. It, it was about learning to let go. I've often described myself as being at the A level art level. And okay, I, I kind of, <laughs> moved on a little bit now. But there are things when you look at as you grow within the art, um, you there are things that you do that take you on to another level. Mm. Um, so, you know, observational art and doing things absolutely is quite often what you get at A-level and then gradually you learn to move away from that and, and expand and, and put back bigger compositions in and that sort of, and your imagination comes into it. But there's also a letting go thing and it, your work is very precious and there's a need to actually step back from that aside from the selling process, but actually to be able to just let your work go and be out there. So having work in, in the Brooklyn Library is, is fantastic. I then came across um, Bruton Correspondence School who were sending out bits, just postcard sized bits of paper and asking you to intervene with them and send it back to them. That eventually led to an exhibition called Don't Lick It. And that was my first introduction to mail art projects. And from them, I came across Amanda Lynch, who set up the Correspondence Collective. And she then had an opportunity to run an exhibition through Clayhill Arts, um, which was called Restriction. And we were all given a little, um, you know, the printmaker's drawers. Mm -hmm. We were all given four sections within the printmaker's drawers um, to put our work into. And that, so you're talking couple of centimetres by three centimetres, you know, really small sections. Yeah, so I that remember seeing those. Yeah, that made me go back smaller again and really challenged me in, in and that's where these, these pieces of paper actually came out um, mm. from putting the work into that. The Clay Hill Arts um, then did a seminar which included a series of talks with the restriction group and that included some films um, about mail art projects in general and more information coming through from there. So that all fed into being able to launch this project on, on Instagram and, and have a pack ready and understand where I was going with it. And I'm a project, I was a project manager, so <laughs> I'm not going to put anything out there until I've got some idea of whether it will work. Um, I love, so mail art projects, that's what this is called. Yes. I had never heard of that. I've never heard of that concept, mail it, art project. It was very big in the 70s. And it's, well, there, there, are, there is a whole world out there of people that do mail art projects. Some of them do it using the power of social media. So they, they build up and, and take it on from there. And some of them, it's word of mouth. So, you know, one artist will get involved and, and send it on to another artist and just say, can you get involved in this? And the more you delve into that the more you realize there is out there i can't remember the name of the the, the most famous one but he he used to do postcards um with sort of like a rabbit on the top of them um sitting on a wall and those would be sent out to people and then he'd get them back with what, the way people had responded to them so absolutely fascinating there's a film oh, somewhere on I'll, I'll try and find the link to the film on on clay hill arts it's quite a long film but it's really fascinating Oh, that'd be amazing. If you could put that into the Facebook comments once yes. you find it, that'd be great. I feel a pure mail art project coming on. <laughs> I, I did a little bit of mail art with Leela because we couldn't meet up. Um, we, mm. we did a few interventions. Um, so we, we, and we challenged each other to, to work on pieces. Um, 
And also Seven Oaks Visual Arts Forum did one as well, which was called More Than. And the idea was we swapped a piece of work with one other um, artist and then we could do what we liked with it. But we were asked at the end of it to take photographs because we couldn't meet in exhibitions. Mm. And also to put our thoughts about it down um, on paper so that that could be shared. So the exhibition was put on the SVAF um, website um, mm. with everybody's thoughts on how it impacted them, which was really interesting. Oh, I think this is a great idea. I that, love the I love the notion of it. I really do. It's a real collaboration, isn't it? It's a real, really good way to collaborate. I, I did do something similar with the children at Eastbourne College and Leela, funnily mm. enough, and Caroline Fraser. And Leela and Caroline swapped pieces of work and enhanced each other's work. And That's then we it. had it as part of the exhibition. I had no understanding that that was part of this kind of genre of mm. male art. So um, you've taught me something because I didn't know that was a thing. And I didn't think there was very much I didn't know about art. <laughs> <laughs> and now I do. So I shall have an open mind in future to know that, uh, you know, there's always something. Someone's That's done the it. Thing. There's always something to learn, isn't there? Mm. And what I've noticed when I've been doing these interviews this time about inspiration is often the artist will say, I have this idea then I did a lot of research. Yeah. That is a critical part of the kind of evolution of, of an idea. I did a lot of research. Sometimes the research comes first mm. as well. You don't realise you're doing it. It's only when you pull it all together you start to realise what strands mm. actually fed into the thing that you're doing now. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, the folding thing was a chance seeing something on um, Instagram from Christina France. She'd been doing some folding work and she mentioned that she'd got a book. And when I messaged her and asked about it, she freely you know, said, this, this is the book. And it's absolutely amazing. It's called Folding Techniques for Designers by a guy called Paul Jackson. And it's about how you do the folding, but it's also about how you understand what the folding is doing for you. It, it, it's a bit difficult to explain, but if you read his introduction, it, it kind of makes sense. No, I can see it's quite therapeutic. I can see it's quite mindful. Mm. And I should yeah. think it actually... Sit here and play with it endlessly. Exactly. But I was also thinking when you were doing that, it's very sustainable. This concept is very sustainable. We've been talking a lot about sustainable. And you're talking about nature mm. and and how your your practice is very much embedded in the natural world and bee conservation and plant conservation, these, um, what did you call them? Not pathways, the... Um, nature corridors. Wildlife nature corridors, corridors, yeah, the wildlife corridors. So underpinning everything we do as we go forward with, if the practice is like that, is this idea that you don't want to be destroying that in any way. Yeah, that's really tricky because an awful lot mm. of artist materials are not sustainable mm. and when you're doing something you have to make a conscious decision on what materials you're going to use and how that impacts and it won't always be the sustainable decision and no that... be because surely that there is also the legacy because you yes. want something to last yes. and I think it's it is sustainable if you choose to take the option that isn't sustainable in the product because you're not it's not something that's going to be thrown away yes. it's not disposable yeah you need to go through the process of saying well it's not single use it's got a message um those sort of things you know mm. and justify in a sense even if it's only in your own mind mm. where you're going with it we're not perfect none of us are perfect and one of the biggest struggles I had with doing projects like this was I didn't want to put my head above the parapet. I didn't want to be, um, I didn't want to be challenged. I didn't want a fight out there. And I think that's taken, lockdown helped me get over that. Um, there was a programme on Radio 4, um, I think it's Forethought, 
and it was called craftism, craftivism, can't say the word properly, um, and that's gentle protest. And just listening to that um, made me realise that you don't have to be confrontational to get things to happen. So this project was about being kind, um, being generous, sharing um, those sort of feelings, but actually just quietly telling one person at a time the message and helping them to pass that message on to other people. So it, it, that feels comfortable for me. Prior to that, it was only about ever talking to perhaps one or two people when they came to an exhibition. You know, when I realised how much people dislike wasps, for example, um, it, it made me want to know what the role of the wasp was in nature and then start explaining that to people one after the other. But with this project, I can go a bit wider than that. I can be a bit braver and talk to more than one person at a time. Do you feel braver now? All much done braver. This? Yes. But I've also got a much broader knowledge. I've spent a lot of time finding out a lot more information. And when you've got knowledge, you, you have confidence in what you're saying. So it, it certainly helps. And as we always say, confidence comes after action, not before it. Yes. Yeah. So and, if, if you wait, you're, you're always waiting, you're not going to get confident. You, so at some point, you do have to put your head above the parapet. Yeah. Mm. And was it worth it, do you think? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I, this project has had me in tears so many times. Tears, not, not sadness tears, because, I mean, it's obviously quite a difficult subject. We are losing insects hand over fist people don't care about insects you know you've got all of that side of it but mm. the warmth and the thought and the effort that people were putting into the project had just you know I picked up the pieces just holding the pieces in my hand and seeing the storyline that people have put on their their little concertina I've got about 100 meters of nature corridor and wow. there were a lot didn't come back but I know that a lot of those people just from having received the information started thinking differently and looking differently mm. um, and the, the conversations that I've had with people have just been amazing the support from people um, just when they say things you know I, I now realize what's out there I, I, I walk around my garden and I listen and I sit and we won't save what we don't know about and what we don't love. So the more people that are starting to think about it, um, the more chance we have of people caring. So, yeah, it's been absolutely mind-blowing. Mm. And you've shown some of the work? Uh, not yet. Next week. I've shown some of my work. Yes, I was going to so, say, you've shown yes, some of your work, because so, we're showing some of your work, so like, you yes, definitely yes. have. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm yes. sure they're on the wall. <laughs> yes, I've, I've shown some of my work, but I haven't shown any of the project responses yet. That's next mm. week. So, so and that's at seven, in Seven Oaks? Yes, at the mm. Kaleidoscope Gallery. Mm. Um, mm. And what will you be showing and how will you be showing it? I don't know how much you can see. Can you see? So I can see some like tubes. And yeah, plus... I'm going to bring it a bit nearer. Yeah, good idea. Fabulous. Wow. So are they glass or are they... you can't hear me, can you? You've got no idea what I'm saying now, Louisa, because you're taking your headphones off. We'll ask her when she comes back and puts her headphones on. So, really what, you me. couldn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, la, 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 no. no you can't hear me. Are they glass or are they plastic? They're glass. They're glass, so they're quite and heavy. That was really important. Yes. Um, but there is plastic within it because I couldn't find another solution. A lot of people worked on both sides of the concertina. 
So I needed to find a way of displaying them to show both sides. My original intention was I was just going to join them all together and create this pile in the corner or, or something or have them hanging in the gallery so that you could see them all. But the, the paper expands out, the, the concertina gets lost. And the thought of hiding some of the things that people had drawn onto these was just beyond me. I couldn't do that, so I had to find another solution. So the vessels are about the fact that if we're not careful, the only place we're going to see wildlife is behind glass, um, in specimen bottles, in captivity, zoos, films, you know, behind screens. We're, we're not going to have it around. So that, that speaks that language. But I couldn't find a way of splitting them up without using plastic so that you could see through and catch glimpses of the other side of, of the people's work. So you see the whole thing. So that was a compromise that I made. But it is, I mean, there is another narrative message in there is that, you know, we, we use a lot of plastic and plastic is, is damaging wildlife. Ooh. Oh, you disappeared <laughs> momentarily there. <laughs> Sometimes if your signal is quite, not quite strong enough, then oh. it'll disappear. You're back now, though. It's okay. I'm back. Yes. You're back. So you've got how many of the glass cylinders will you be showing? Uh, somewhere between 12 and 15. Wow. I haven't finished filling them up yet so we saw one just tilt it across because they're absolutely they're they're beautiful objects and i can see you've got mm. you, have you gone kind of color orientated yes. so you've got like the black and white monochrome and then quite blue colors black and, black, black and white with a touch of gold right uh there's a green one and a yellowy a blue one and a yeah there's one that's sort of water yeah um, and then there's a green and yellows and there's a beige one and yeah there's a whole selection are they all the same size the glass cylinders are they all the glass there's same 12 size? that size and there's three smaller ones that are sort of in reserve oh just in case you get more come in yes <laughs> i'm still sending them out there's still people asking to join in which is absolutely fantastic that's amazing that's amazing so will all of the concertinas be encapsulated because i love that concept of you know you are making a point there aren't you that you know what we don't want is to end up in that zoo concept yeah I and mean, thankfully zoos have turned into conservation as opposed to viewing rooms now but it's still bad yeah. um we don't want to see our animals like that but so you're making a really good point with that um so i can understand the use of the of the plastic there how will you be displaying them in the gallery to to tell that narrative i have a lovely husband I know. who has built me <laughs> <laughs> for them to be yeah to be displayed on so okay yeah so people will be able to kind of wander around and through them yes yeah okay and there'll be um, there's a few that will be on the wall as well very few but um yeah some some don't work in the no. The one thing that like, people kept saying, or oh, am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do that? And I just wanted people to have the opportunity to think outside the box. Mm. And some of them really have. And that's been quite a challenge. <laughs> yeah. So have they changed the size and the style or have they stuck to the concertina? They've done all sorts of things. Yes. Some of them have, have cut them so that they taper off. There's been sewing, there's been um, sticking, um, collage, sticking pieces on that, that stick out. Um, what was one came from? Oh, Bina Shah did termite mounds. And so hers is now about that high. <laughs> That's going to be a challenge, that one. I haven't worked that one out yet. Um, so yes, there's, it, it's been absolutely fantastic. I didn't want anyone to be restricted by this. I wanted them to just mm. yeah push the envelope and, and mm. really think hard about it. And there's been some amazing responses. So next week, we're going to have the exhibition where you're going to show these beautiful glass vessels and people will be able to walk around. How long is the show on for? Sadly, it's only on for a week. So it opens Tuesday <sighs> morning and it closes Saturday afternoon. I'm doing a, a live talk. Excuse me while I quickly get my diary. <laughs> <laughs> so how many days you say? <laughs> Tuesday to Saturday. Oh my goodness. There gracious. will be masses of photographs, but I just want people to come and see it because they are so exquisite. And I was sitting during lockdown opening up all of these pieces 
and and part of the tears were just that I knew nobody else would see my reaction to opening them and have that opportunity. Mm. In the end, actually, Leela came um, for a, a couple of days, well, three days with me, and she's been opening all the envelopes again because I, I got so that I was terrified of losing them. Mm. Um, so I put them all back in their envelopes and they were just filed in a box for quite some time before I was brave enough to get them out again. And so she came and she had that opportunity to really come and look closely. So uh, at least one other person has now shared it, which is great. Shared but, the opening experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Vincent's saying, could we move it to Ballantyne's as an exhibition? I'm sure we could, <laughs> Vincent. <laughs> yeah, it could go anywhere after that. It's, yeah. it's actually staying, well, some of it is staying within the kaleidoscope, in, I, hopefully up until at least Christmas. Mm. Um, they've, I've got the main gallery space, which I was quite surprised about when I first mm. had the idea of the project. I thought I'd be out in the mezzanine, but it's become big enough to go in the, in the gallery space. Mm. Um, but we'll move as much of it as I can out into the mezzanine until Christmas. And then I've just had notification that um, I've got an opportunity to expand and show more um, at Somerton Art, uh, Ace Arts in Somerton, which is in Somerset. Mm. Um, next october november so we'll be off again but yeah this... will it will you keep will you keep adding to it will it keep growing I, uh, that's the sort of question i can't answer yet until yeah. it, i see how it grows about five years ago i was involved in the moth migration project mm. seven x visual arts forum yeah, I remember put a show up at kaleidoscope mm. and then sent it out to the and they're about to do another exhibition they've got thousands of moths now um, and so there's a new one going to start in in Denver mm. um, somewhere early next year I think mm. um, yeah so it's, who knows it's who an knows? exciting idea I yes. think definitely you will see these vessels in Valentine's Vincent because I clearly as a curator I cannot have them sitting any anywhere where people can't see them good so, I don't need them in my house yeah <laughs> So we'll make sure that we make that happen next year when we start doing, you know, some of our more, it's going to be a lot more about sustainability and nature and such like for the first half of the year. So definitely we will look to have some of these beautiful vessels on show. So you say this project will carry on evolving, but you don't really know how. It needs to, I had a number of um, nursery groups, young um, year one, year two primary school children, their teachers heard about it and, and got the children involved and they were absolutely gorgeous. So lovely. Um, my favourite one, I think, was Grace, who flatly refused to work on any of the pieces that she was sent. So she had to make her whole own concertina and, and then draw on it. So they have been, the children have been so inspired by it as well. So I think I want to take it to more children um because they are the ones that need to know about the insects they're the ones that need to think about it and and push us to well edith and, and bev are goading you into going and approaching the natural history <laughs> museum i'm behind them i'm completely with them i think that's absolutely right i think there's a, a bigger thing here i think what you've you've started something incredible and it's got it will it will gradually gain momentum as you move forward with it and there will be times in the year when i can see that you know other things will emerge so yes be very interesting to see how i'm open to, to what she's open to she's open to questions I mean, the other place <laughs> unfortunately it clashes we're doing um, the wilderness art collective are doing a field mm. studies week um, next year so 2022 in October and we have made contact with Rye Harbour Nature Reserve so the idea was some of this would be shown there and I would also spend time there engaging with the people that come in. We have started an insect group at Rye Harbour Nature Reserve, well, not me but I'm involved in it, mm. um, as to make people think about the fact it's not just the birds that are there, there's, there's plants and, and insects and mammals and all the other things that are going on. So. We want to move that on and, and encourage people. Such an amazing place, right? Um, mm. Nature, Rye Harbour Nature Reserve. I have become a friend. Good. Yes. yes. I made I, Paul become a friend too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really appreciate what it was about birding until I was there last week for our meeting. 
and I'd spent some time in the hide and as I came out something like 800 godwits all took off at one one moment because there was a sparrowhawk flying through and the noise as they went across it it wasn't loud it was sort of like a whisper but it was quite spine tingling really and I actually began to appreciate you know what it is about I mean I love birds don't get me wrong but I'm really an insect person but I could see why people spend so much time at reserves you have done some bird things haven't you I did I started out with drawing birds I've got a small collection um yeah so yes I do I like birds but insects somehow are just something extra mm -hmm. Vincent said, will you still have time to do your own work? You are doing it in and around this project, aren't you? I am. And some of my own work will be on the walls at Kaleidoscope as well, because it's part of the context of the exhibition. So I've done some more new little round concertina pieces that are currently with Adrian um, mm. being framed up. And they're they look beautiful. A, they're quite a challenge to fix, to, to get in place. Mm. Uh, but I'm, yeah, I'm loving those. Mm. they are very photogenic are you still doing your because you've always done that daily drawing are you still doing that mm, not really no um i'm drawing most days even if it's only a wasp <laughs> because someone needs a pack sent out mm. um but i'm not necessarily daily drawing i don't need that practice quite as much um that was part of the ten thousand hours mm. the beginning to get yeah. your the process under your belt mm. um, but I am very keen at this point in time to actually sit down and do some observational drawing I want to draw some butterflies or, or something really precisely I need that time I think, mm. to settle again yes yeah because you just this has been an, a, an enormous project a lot bigger than I expected <laughs> <laughs> yeah how, how amazing though it how is. incredible yes you should be yeah. very rightly proud of yourself for what I'm you've done. Very excited to see it up in that beautiful white cube space next week. Mm. I think yeah. it's just going to be amazing. And are you going to have it filmed and photographed? I hope so. Yes. Yes. Because mm. it'd be a shame if you didn't have it filmed and photographed. Well, there's so many people that can't come and see it. They're too far mm. away. So mm. I want to get that feeling out there for them mm. to give them that opportunity. Yeah. All the people who've contributed. And there's a satellite exhibition going on at pretty much the same time in Princeton, in New Jersey. In the oh, is there? Um, one of the I shall send my sister-in-law. <laughs> yes, do. I don't I know will. whether it started yet. Um, a lady called Mary Waltham um, took part in the project with me, um, and then she's part of a group in, in Princeton, um, Princeton Artist Directory, I think they call themselves. So it's at the Princeton so, Library. Yeah, she took a group, she took a pile of, of concertinas out and encouraged a group of artists there to do it and what I'm seeing coming back on Instagram is just gorgeous and they've linked up with another charity in America which is called I think Xerxes I think it's pronounced mm. X-E-R-C-E-S and it's the equivalent of bug life so it's another insect oh, wow. society so that's been great uh, quite mm. a few people sort of said to me you know I didn't realize that this was international that I could still do it if I wasn't in the UK and although I hadn't actually actually said that I hadn't encouraged international so that's mm. another step that can be taken as well so yeah well I'll see if we can get some photos of the stuff in New Jersey I shall message Maria and yeah. see if encourage her to go and have a look yeah um Julia said sorry that was I was like I've got something in my head I need to say <laughs> I needed to find it. Julia saying there, have you been in touch with Sue, Sarah Benyon at Oxford University about the dung beetles? Oh, no. Oh, well, I think you need to, I think you need to do that. I'm sure Julia will put you um, direct you in the right, point you in the right direction for that. Because that that would be fascinating. And Julia's worked on obviously the the wildlife corridors all in Sussex. So that you know she she knows a lot about that conversation. Has Julia done one of your concertinas? Yes, I'm sure she has. <laughs> <laughs> Her grandchildren have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we've got a few questions down here. So Bev says, "What's next? Another species, or continue with insects?" 
Um, I'm part of an exhibition next year, I can't remember the title of it, um, in <laughs> half, um, which is Butterflies. It's about relating to a book. So we were all sent a book and we take something from that. So my book was all about butterflies. So I will be doing something on cabbage white butterflies. Not entirely sure what yet, but I've had so much inspiration from the way people have responded to the concertinas. I've got some ideas of, of how I might want to take it on um, and expand it. So yeah, have lots of thoughts going on there. I'm drawing beetles occasionally. Um, I was given a little tiny book that's, that, and it's absolutely perfect for drawing beetles. So I draw one of those every so often. Um, to build up the book so and I've got a couple of stag beetles that my nephew is supposed to be setting for me um, but hasn't done yet so that's a nudge to him <laughs> would you like to name him no. <laughs> <laughs> just to he's, really um, really push that forward he's, he's he's one of the wardens at um, Dungeness um, on the estate of Dungeness mm. so and um, he's my go-to when I don't know what something is, um, he, he was always the person I would send this really rotten photograph of um, and say, please, can you ID this one? <laughs> and he usually got there. But uh... <laughs> So dung beetles and butterflies. And I wonder if folded paper will be involved. Oh, you... yes. There'll be oh, some yes. folded paper Definitely involved. Folded paper involved. I'm, I'm loving the folding. <laughs> There you are, Bev. Hopefully that answers your question. And Fran says, you mentioned social media. Was this critical to the expansion of the Flight Path, flight path Project? That's a tongue twister. Mm. If so, which platform in particular? Yes, absolutely critical. And what was really lovely was so many people were sharing pictures of their own pieces before they sent them back to me and their thoughts and inspiration when they were doing it. So we've all had a chance to look at and, and understand what it means to everyone else. Um, we, we set up the hashtag Flight Path Community Project quite early on. And so it's quite easy to follow what, what people have been doing. And then at each piece I have then shared on my social media um, with words from the people that have taken part. So it, it's all contained within that. So. Um, so generally Instagram? I, I've put it on all the platforms, um, but certainly the responses have mostly been Instagram. Okay, so you, when you say all, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter? No, Twitter. Not, not, not Pinterest, uh, mm, Twitter. So just Twitter, so those three? Yeah. Mm, those are the three that you've focused on? Yeah. Okay, and thank you. And Vincent says, as your as you your drawings are very fine and delicate involving lots of concentration and eye strain do you ever feel like working big part of the start of this project was working big i was working on great big sheets of paper mark making and randomly trying to find compositions and and sort of explore what graphite would do i I regularly want to go bigger. I regularly get this idea that going bigger will be the right thing, but I end up coming down even smaller afterwards. It just doesn't feel quite right for me. Um, yeah, I keep pushing it every so often, but I don't know that I ever will get really bigger. I'm very, very short sighted. So my natural vision is about sort of six inches in front of my face. So trying to do anything bigger than that means a lot of manoeuvring myself um, into the right positions. And I, I don't know, mm. it, it doesn't settle. So you're but comfortable? I'm very comfortable with yeah, the size and the, the, what I'm doing. And usually when I do go bigger, it ends up just being multiples of something smaller. Um, we went to London last week um, and there was the graduate show at the Saatchi Gallery and there was one piece of work in that that was about two metres square and she'd worked with graphite and charcoal and berry juice and all sorts of things and it was a black sheet of paper, huge piece that again had been folded so she'd folded it 
one way and then folded it the other way. So you've got all these different nuances. And it was absolutely stunning stood in front of it. But when I got home and looked at the photograph, it looked no different from anything that I was doing. <laughs> it was really weird sensation. Do you think it's important to go and see those graduate shows? Oh, gosh, yes. There's so much exciting stuff going on. Mm. They have access to things that, to use that we don't. Um, there was a, a beautiful piece done 3D printing ceramics. And I, you know, where do you go to get hold of a 3D printer? There's great mm. exciting stuff that technology that they're playing with, but still keeping it arty. And that's, that's really mm. interesting. Mm. So they're yeah. still being honest to the material. Mm. And the materials and the concept of fine art, but they're using the digital yes. to yes. take it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I absolutely agree. I think I think you all artists, as their critical ten thousand hours, not only should be drawing every day, but should be going and exposing themselves to art and experiencing art every day and seeing what's going on out there. Because it's not about copying, it's about being immersed. Yeah immersed in it and that in a sense that's what i've got from this project by everybody sending back what they're doing i've had that opportunity to have new ideas thrown at me the whole time yeah you've been immersed in the envelopes yeah. yep literally covered. literally <laughs> <laughs> covered in the en envelopes yeah, yeah it's a, it, it's a fascinating it's been fascinating to observe and very rewarding to watch you grow because you've definitely grown through this experience and it was something that was a critical part of your next evolution was to push yourself out of your your comfort zone for sure because you were very very accomplished but comfortable yeah. so it's been very good to watch um, you grow in that way and now become braver to to take to put your head above the parapet as you describe it and and take those bright, bigger braver steps into the more global narrative yes last question bev says sustainability and protecting insects seems important to you is this your main inspiration would you like what would you like to achieve yeah what's your legacy with that Finding like-minded people who don't necessarily know everything, but are willing to learn and willing to adapt. And I think that's what I've been finding with the project is, is other people to connect with both in the art sense and insect sense. Um, in the human sense. Yes. Yeah. Because we're nature. I don't know why we separate ourselves out. No, and we shouldn't. Well, we separate ourselves out because we think we're bigger than everything else, and we're not. No, we're nature. We're, and in, you know, why do we think we're different from nature? So it's the conversation. Hmm. It's being a vehicle for that conversation. And there's been a number of people that have said to me that doing this project got them unstuck got them drawing again it's, it, it's it's really complicated there's so many little things that have come out of this that have meant so much to me um, but yeah just it, it made people look it made people draw again it made them realize that uh, quite a lot came back and said oh, i'm not i'm not an artist um, but i'll have a go um, mm -hmm. and the pieces that they sent back are just gorgeous but they've been measuring themselves against the photographs that I've been sharing on Instagram. Mm. And it's only when I've taken photographs of their piece and put them up with their message that they've come back and said, oh, I get it now. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. What a, I mean, if uh, that's the legacy, isn't it? It's like mm. making people look. Mm. Yeah. And also you've become braver but you've helped other people become a bit little bit braver as well that's just life-changing mm. that's incredible yeah. to be able to facilitate that for somebody and hold the space for somebody to grow mm. it is yeah mm. it's quite humbling as well mm. yeah amazing well i wish you the most amazing successful show 
next week at Seven Oaks, I will be dashing in there on Friday morning. Lovely. <laughs> According to my diary. <laughs> I'm planning and hoping I will be there all week. Uh, we've, we've got an early setup on, on the Monday. We've been allowed in early so that we can try and get this set up because it's such a short run. And mm. I'll be doing a talk on the Saturday afternoon around 2 p.m. Oh, there you are. So anyone, we... what date's that? That's the 27th. 27th. Yeah, the 27th. Um, so if anyone is interested, how do they get tickets for the it's, for the talk? Just turn up. Just it's turn open. up. So. Yeah. Yes. So no, no booking required. You can turn up for the talk on Saturday afternoon on the 27th at Seven, Ar Seven Oaks Visual Arts Forum, which is just behind the high street. Parking just outside. Parking outside, or I think you can park in Waitrose, but you have to pay, don't you? You have to pay everywhere. Wherever, wherever you are. <laughs> it's Seven Oaks, I forgot about that. Yes. <laughs> there are very few free parking spaces in Seven Oaks. But it's a beautiful gallery, as you say, and it's very well worth the visit if you haven't been to Seven Oaks um, Visual Arts Forum. It's a beautiful gallery, beautiful space. So I really, I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see it all in situ and just to experience that walking through those um, glass specimen jars, cylinders, vessels. vessels. Yeah, vessels. Yeah. Mm. yeah, no, amazing. Thank you so much, Louisa. As always, an absolute delight to chat to you and hear the journey of this particular project. I think it's been enlightening and inspiring for everybody who's been listening can see that by the comments um, in the side and by the questions that people have asked. And as I said, if anyone's been watching over on Facebook, because I'm sure they have, I can actually check that on the restream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can check that there. It's all there. Yes, it's all running. <laughs> they can see us. Um, if you pop your comments in the um, or questions in the comment section then we'll come over there and have a look at them and make sure they get answered in the next few days Julia Desh I just want to point out that you have a comment on one on yours from yesterday from Marcus if you want to go over and have a have an answer to that I did tag, uh, tag you in yes yes Julia <laughs> I'm talking to you Julia <laughs> you had one yesterday so yeah um Louisa, I'm sure, well, she's very good at social media, aren't you? So you'll go in and have a look and see what people are saying. I will. Yes, yeah. so I'm just looking at the comments on the side here because I can't do, I can't multitask. Yeah, it's lovely. Some really lovely comments yeah. in the side. I'm just going back to, to Julia saying about the Oxford University. The mm. um, Natural History Museum at Oxford is the most beautiful building and a wonderful mm. collection in there. So that might be my target for the project. Ooh. There you go. Mm. There you go. Right. Well, we've you heard it here first, people. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I don't I, I always encourage you all to aim high. So I won't be um, I won't be encouraging that to go any lesser now. So it's only going to be there or above. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm here to support you. So and I will help you. You know that. So thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating, as always. Just having a look. So we've got the next live session is Juliet Scott on Monday. So we will see you all here on Monday, 7.30, when I'll be chatting to Juliet. She's a photographer, and we've got some of her work on exhibition in the Reimagined show at the moment. So beautiful work. Incredibly clever and beautiful and, and quite um, intricate in, in the way she delivers her work. I think it's, it looks quite um, almost like it's stitched, doesn't it? Yeah. work it's incredible yeah. so yeah we'll be chatting to Juliet on Monday but thank you so much Louisa thank and you. um good luck with everything and I'll see you on Friday morning <laughs> <laughs> not this Friday next Friday. not this Friday <laughs> not this Friday no can't do that <laughs> following Friday <laughs> thank goodness it's a Friday goodness it's a Friday week otherwise never would have been as a week <laughs> so yes lovely and thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you live on Monday all right bye for now Bye.